which are not just giving you how to do something they are also giving you a dedicated roadmap exact set of problems salary breakdowns expectations and what not they need to make some projects if possible they need to go to some hackathons they can try to grab some internships in startups they should try to seek referrals on linkedin and what not this is like a bare minimum effort that people are actually making just to checklist all of the given point given a logic you are able to convert that into code that gives you the first stepping stone for being a software engineer all of these things are very very important but don't just keep on solving to achieve a number that okay i have solved 400 questions but you have just maybe wrote learn all of those questions you can try to implement a movie booking system now movie booking system has a lot of interesting engineering challenges let me list out some of you when you're learning things that i want to be a good software engineer learn with respect to that learn that in software engineering how this can be helpful for me learn in actual products how this will be actually applied when you have to optimize your application you have to go extremely low level for example understand what is v8 engine saying that it's a js engine is not sufficient enough understand how v8 engine works how v8 engine empowers node.js the tech job market is absolutely brutal you will see this statement coming from a lot of freshers and in fact people who are already working in the industry as well in this particular video i would like to express a few opinions from my side that why exactly all of this is actually happening what are some of the key problems that are existing as of now in the new set of candidates that are trying to apply to this job market what are some of the things that at least i believe all of you should definitely try to do if you want to sail through all of this storm that we are actually going through so without any further ado let's just start but before starting the video if you have not yet subscribed to the channel i would highly recommend you guys to subscribe to the channel because we are going to put some really awesome content around tech and career up ahead so without any further ado, let's just start. See, I'll tell you some very specific pointers and some very specific problems. So I started my like full-fledged coding journey in 2016. To be very honest, the amount of awareness that what to do something, how to do something was extremely low at that point of time. And if you even go further, let's say around 2012 or 2013, it was even lesser. But the abundance of information that we have nowadays and the amount of information around the tech hiring and the tech culture and different different companies that we have nowadays is extremely high. It's not 1x, 2x, 10x. It's probably 100x more than what it used to be around in 2016, 15 or 14. Now, because of that, what you will see is everybody, like every student nowadays knows what to do. During my time, I still remember when I was in the first year of my college, a lot of students used to be a lot clueless that how to do something, what are some of the key things that they need to do in order to get a tech job altogether in the big tech giants, fintech companies, startups, what are exactly the things that they need to do. They used to seek guidance from seniors and maybe try to reach out to actually the people who are working. Nowadays, we don't have to do all of that. Nowadays, a lot of information is available on the YouTube, lead code like platforms and so many more websites are there which are not just giving you how to do something they are also giving you a dedicated roadmap exact set of problems salary breakdowns expectations and whatnot due to this now every single student if you go to any college and just randomly pick 10 odd students i'm definitely sure that among those 10 students five to seven students will be there who have already solved let's say 300 or 400 odd lead code questions so it's more like the awareness has been so uh, vast nowadays that everybody know that they need to do some algorithmic problem solving on lead code they need to make some projects if possible they need to go to some hackathons they can try to grab some internships and in startups they should try to seek referrals on linkedin and whatnot because of this now because everybody is doing the same thing the competition is increasing on a very high pace Earlier, people used to do a lot of algorithmic problem solving on platforms like Codeforces, Codechef, and do then used to do a lot of competitive programming, basically for two purposes: because to make sure that they are ready for very hard level problems altogether, and it was enjoyed as a sport as well. Before moving forward, I would like to tell you about our brand new offering at AlgoCamp around the advanced Spring Boot backend development cohort. So we were getting a lot of requests to actually launch our next iteration of the Spring Boot cohort, and here we are. This one is far more bigger and better than the last one and trust me if you are somebody who is looking to start their journey in the world of Spring Boot in the backend ecosystem or maybe you already know some things about backend development maybe in Spring Boot or maybe in some other tech stack this is going to be a one-stop solution for you we are going to talk about everything from the absolute beginner level to the advanced level in Spring Boot we are going to talk about how exactly you can set up your backend ecosystem and backend projects in Spring Boot we are going to take a microservice driven architecture and build different different projects including an Uber app including Airbnb app, payment wallet like Paytm wallet app and many more. We are going to talk about how exactly microservices can actually communicate with each other in synchronous and asynchronous fashion. 
we are going to see a lot of interesting microservices pattern like CQRS pattern, Saga pattern for distributed transaction, how you can implement Saga pattern through orchestration and choreography, how Saga pattern is going to help you with respect to the implementation if you compare that with two-phase commit, how you can implement each one of them, what is the outbox pattern, how exactly event sourcing is going to work, how you can integrate Kafka for your event sourcing and whatnot. We are going to see so many interesting database concepts like how exactly no SQLs are internally implemented using LSM trees, what are write ahead logs, how you can replicate your databases, how you can shard your databases, how you can design a good database schema and whatnot. All the topics that we are going to cover must be listed in front of you on the screen here. What I can say is that this course is going to be one stop solution to become an advanced backend engineer in Spring Boot. This is definitely going to demand some good time commitment from all the students who are interested but trust me this is going to be one hell of a ride. So what are you waiting for? Do check out the link in the description section below and read the complete end-to-end -end syllabus of what we are going to cover in the Spring Boot cohort. You can actually use the coupon SPRING2025 to get maximum possible discount on the course and I'm really excited to see you guys in the cohort, right? Do check out the link in the description section below and let's get back to the video. Nowadays, most of the people actually know that the questions are going to somewhat be a tweak of the already existing problems on lead code. So people just follow lead code. And because of the fact that lead code is a very good resource, they have some really good solutions altogether. Everybody is solving problems on lead code. And there's a good chance that you and your partner might have solved 80 to 90% same questions. So if the number of questions or the type of question that you are solving is almost similar to everybody, what's the differentiating factor? Even if you see in project building, most of the people nowadays make a very similar kind of very mediocre projects. You will find some common projects like Yelp Cam in so many different resumes. The problem coming here is that everybody is making same project, the knowledge base is same, the amount of effort actually put into make those uh, I would say projects is actually same. So it doesn't make a differentiating factor and hence everybody is stuck in this loop of mediocrity. Why I'm saying this is mediocrity because this is like a bare minimum effort that people are actually making just to checklist all of the given pointers. They are not making some extra effort in order to make sure that their profile, their resume actually stands out when a recruiter or an engineering manager or a hiring manager is actually reading them. And that's what I'm going to, I'm going to focus on the remaining part of this video, that what are some of the key things that you can do in order to ensure that your resume doesn't stay mediocre anymore. So let's get straight to the point. What are some of the things that you can actually do in order to avoid all of this mediocrity in your candidature? First of all, you need to ensure that your profile is actually looking for a software engineering role, right? To be very honest, companies do not need lead coders. Companies are not going to do a lot of things with somebody who has solved, let's say, 800 or 600 or let's say 500 odd questions. These questions are not going to directly resonate in your final end-to-end -end job, right? But should you not do DSA? Absolutely, I'm not saying that. DSA is going to be one of the most fundamental things that you have to have to do because the moment you have the skill that given a logic, you are able to convert that into code, that gives you the first stepping stone for being a software engineer. But when you are even solving the DSA question, don't just solve it with respect to a number in mind. Solve it with respect to the actual concept behind the scenes. There are so many data structures and algorithmic problems on lead code, which are actual real software engineering problems. You see problems like, uh, let's say, LRU cache, LFU cache, these kind of problems, or let's say merge interval kind of like problems, tree brace problems. All of these problems, if you see, are very, I would say, very much correlated with actual software engineering work. Right. For example, there is a question on lead code called as simplify path. That simplify path problem or the algorithm that you're going to write in the simplified path problem is going to be the same algorithm that internally Linux also uses in order to change your directory from one directory to another. So all of these things are very, very important, but don't just keep on solving to achieve a number that, okay, I have solved 400 questions, but you have just maybe wrote learn all of those questions. Apart from that, when you're actually doing project building, don't just build some, let's say simple CRUD apps, of course. CRUD apps or just basic simple apps are very, very important if you are getting started into an ecosystem. For example, recently I was learning a couple of things for a new programming language. And for that, I definitely made uh, one of the apps as to-do list app, like just to get started with it so that I can get friendly and get some more hands-on experience with the ecosystem. Once we have that, then your project building part should actually involve some interesting real life engineering problem to solve. How can you get that? Try to read system design articles for some of the projects and then try to implement those. For example, 
you can try to implement a movie booking system. Now, movie booking system has a lot of interesting engineering challenges. Let me list out some of you. That how you are going to store the seat structure in a theater. How the overall DB design is going to look like for a complete book my show like application. What if two people actually selected the same seat at the same point of time and then tried to proceed for, for that same booking or that same seat. How you are actually going to f work on that how you can make the user only select a range of seats altogether and so on. You can see a lot of different different I would say database related problem concurrency related problems are there and these are actual real problems that these systems actually face. So why not make projects that are actually solving something that are actually solving some real engineering problem. Try to work on real engineering problem because the exposure that they are going to give you is going to be immense and as of now not a lot of students focus on actual real engineering problems that will make your resume stand out as well. So this is also a very very crucial part and also at AlgoCamp whatever projects we try to uh, create in the classes for let's say the Node.js batch or let's say the Spring Boot batch we ensure that every project has at least one problem to solve one good engineering problem to solve rather than just making crud APIs. So so similar thing you have to also follow for your upcoming projects. Now you also need to know one thing that just making projects on your own is not going to give you actual exposure. Try to expose yourself to things like hackathons. Try to ensure that you are participating in hackathons with the team so that you know how team culture works because there a lot of times there will be behavioral rounds where you will be expected to answer some questions with respect to team management or let's say with respect to team contributions. If you have never worked in a team then these questions can be really hard to answer because most of the time the interviewers generally catch the people who are actually making things up or maybe you won't get the best ratings altogether. So make sure that you go to hackathons or maybe you try to get some internships in some small startups altogether so that you can get the idea of how things work in a team, how things work on a more complex problem altogether because hackathons have some really complex problem statements and you can build some really awesome solution on top of that. And of course, if you win that hackathon, then that is going to be one more great thing to put in your resume. Apart from that, for internships, I solely believe that going to startups is going to give you humongous amount of exposure. Startups don't waste time. You will be probably expected to raise your first PR on maybe the first day of your joining, right? So this fast paced culture is going to teach you a lot of things in very less amount of time. And generally you have less time in your college days as well, right? So try to join more startups during your college days for internship or maybe if even your first job is in a startup that can be a really great exposure for your overall candidature and once you have that experience then you can try to move to bigger companies like Google, Meta, Microsoft all of these different different type, type of companies because they are going to give you exposure of humongous amount of scale, good big user base, very complex code bases and very complex problems to solve. So everywhere there is a different type of a learning. You don't need to be in your shell that, okay, I am making some, okay, Yelp cam kind of like project. I have done 300 question and I will be able to crack any company. Don't be in that particular myth. Everybody nowadays has done the bare minimum to actually be a software engineer. You have to move out of this mediocrity. You have to make some extra effort. You have to start reading articles, increase your knowledge base, understand that just knowing a language and a framework is not going to give you a job. Instead, knowing the concepts of a particular type of an engineering is actually going to give you a job. No matter you are doing things with Node.js, no matter you are doing things with Spring Boot, everything can teach you the same engineering concepts. Now, a lot of people actually, uh, I would say, learn Node.js because it's easy to learn Node.js. And definitely, I resonate with that particular fact. But you need to ensure one thing that Node.js or let's say learning MERN stack is not the ultimate thing that will always give you the job. Maybe at the job you're working on C Sharp or maybe Python or maybe Golang. Consider these tech stacks like MERN stack, Spring Boot, all of these as the tools to learn the backend concepts, right? Doesn't matter whether you know Android or iOS, there is a good chance that if you know good amount of Android engineering, people will be ready to give you a chance for iOS engineering as well. So don't learn everything. Try to actually master one tech stack and go deep in that tech stack. Like for example, if you are going with Node.js, maybe you won't get eventually a Node.js job, but the places where people will be expecting you to know good Node.js will be expecting you to know deep internals of Node.js because when you have to optimize your application, you have to go extremely low level. For example, understand what is V8 engine. Saying that it's a JS engine is not sufficient enough. Understand how V8 engine works, how V8 engine empowers Node.js, what are the components of V8 engine, what is crankshaft in V8 engine, what are the different different components, how exactly the libuv library works, Node.js is written in C++, so how the JS layer of Node.js communicates with the C++ layer and what not. Try to go deep internal at least in one tech stack, at least in one database so that if those questions, if deep internal questions are asked to you, you are at least able to answer with respect to 
one tech stack altogether. A lot of time this happens to me that okay, if the interview that I'm giving to the company is using some other language, no worries. I generally mentioned this earlier that I have not worked in your language ecosystem, but the language ecosystem that I have worked it, I know how exactly to pull off this particular problem statement in that language, uh, I would say ecosystem. So always be that confident that you are able to convince the other people that I will be able to pull off your new tech stack or your new language ecosystem. So all of these efforts together are going to help you to avoid this mediocrity and help you to become a better software engineer. Try to always keep one goal when you're learning things that I want to be a good software engineer. Learn with respect to that. Learn that in software engineering, how this can be helpful for me. Learn in actual products, how this will be actually applied. This is going to take you quite far in your journey altogether. And that's it. That, those are the things that I would like to mention to all of you to ensure that your candidature for your next job search is as good as possible. Let me know in the comment section below, what are your thoughts? What do you guys think are something that is actually causing so much problems for people to actually get their next tech job? That being said, let's wrap this particular video here and we are going to meet in the further set of videos where we are going to talk about a lot of more things around your tech and career. Till then, take care. Bye-bye. I'm Sanket Singh, signing off.